Very good. Thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, as you know, I'm both a neurologist and a neuroscientist, so I, I, I'm, I'm double interested in everything you're saying, both from the scientific point of view and from my experience as a practitioner in the field of neurology. Uh, so I couldn't resist, since the title of this conference is, uh, has to do with big data, uh, offering some reflections on big data uh, and what it means from the point of view of neurobiology. Uh, and uh, my experience with big data is, is more or less like this. Uh, three or four years ago, when I started hearing the term, and I would ask the people in our group, uh, the ones that are, for example, artificial intelligence experts, computer scientists, and I said, what on earth is going on? What is big data? Uh, and I got a very interesting range of, uh, of answers. I was not quite sure I, I got the full meaning of it. Uh, but then, little by little, I started being very impressed with some of the things that alleged big data uh, experiments or studies could uh, offer. For example, the ability to predict an incoming epidemic from patterns of behavior that were being gleaned in sort of very simple sensing uh, out there in the real world. So I, I, I think, that although, uh, like Carla, I happen not to like the term and have a certain distaste for it, uh, why not accept it uh, if it really is interpreted the right way? But one thing that I find a little bit troubling is the idea that this is really completely new, and reflecting upon it, I have to say that the brain is the ultimate processor of big data, and in fact has been dealing with it for a long, long time, for as long as we have, in fact, biological systems operating on Earth. Uh, and I would just like to refer you to two things that happen all the time, and have been happening, in fact, this morning, and one has to do with the process of intuition, and the other has to do with the process of making what I'm making right now, which is phrase after phrase using the English language. What has this got to do with big data? It has to do with the fact that in order for me to intuit anything, for example, to uh, glean that a certain pattern may have meaning X, I am, in fact, using all the powers of my brain in terms of past knowledge, both the knowledge that I acquired in my lifetime, as well as the knowledge that is inside my brain, thanks to the genome and thanks to the way neural circuits have been placed inside my brain, and I'm using the combined powers with huge volumes of data from huge volumes of circuitry in order to arrive at a certain answer. Uh, and I was trying to illustrate this with a very simple example, and yesterday afternoon, uh, Hannah and I went to the Thyssen Museum, just across from the hotel, and we were looking at a wall of paintings, uh, happened to be 20th century paintings, and I scanned the wall, and it so happened that I could rapidly recognize the author of most of those paintings, but there was one right in the middle that I couldn't. Very odd painting, it was actually rectangular, but in a, a vertical rectangle, and I couldn't for the life of me identify who the painter was. And I kept looking at it, I didn't come close to it, and suddenly I said, this could be David Hockney. I had no idea at that moment why I thought it was David Hockney. And I came closer to the painting, and it was, in fact, David Hockney. I've never seen any painting like that by Mr. Hockney. Uh, it was very unusual in the shape, in the use of color, but that there were a couple of traces on the side of the painting that, on closer analysis, are, in fact, very Hockney-esque. And it was that little item that gave me the clue that this might be a painting by David Hockney. It turned out that I was right, but I could have been perfectly wrong. But that's the way you operate on the basis of big data. You have these very large volumes of information, and then you call through them. In the case of intuition, you do it automatically. You don't really know what kind of algorithms you're using, but you're using something like that. Uh, the same thing in making sentences and in allowing you to understand what I'm saying. I am in fact predicting as I go along that I'm going to use a certain structure and I'm going to have a prediction of which noun I'm going to use, which verb, which adjective I'm going to place or adverb in the sentence. And I'm in fact not 
in full conscious control of this, and if I were, I would be paralyzed. I would not be able to say one or, or, or more words per minute. And in fact, I'm producing all these words because there's this machine that is allowing me to create these sentences or sentences close to them. They don't have to be exactly the same, uh, and there's a very different way of using language when you're speaking, the way I'm speaking right now, or, or when you're composing a sentence for uh, an article or for a poem. Uh, those are very different uses, but the reliance on big data and enormous volumes of data is in fact quite, uh, quite obvious. Uh, this uh, leads me also to tell you something about the structure of our brains that has to do with big data, which is with the act of prediction. Um, people have for a very, very long time, in fact, probably until as recently as two decades ago, thought of the brain, take, for example, in relation to perception, as the sort of system in which information would come from the outside, would, would be a collection of inputs, imagine visual, auditory, tactile inputs into the system, and everything would really go from the outside in across a set of structures, a hierarchy of structures ending in the higher levels of the brain stem and the uh, cerebral cortex. Uh, and there was absolutely nothing that would come out of that system except in the form of our own mind processes and in the form of external behavior. Well, it turns out that this is in fact completely wrong. And over the past three decades, we've had more and more information about the fact that what goes in tends to be not even as voluminous as what is coming from the top of the brain down. And what is happening is that there is a system of connections that goes in, let's call them input convergent uh, uh, connections, and then there's a system of feedback, actually the, the term feedback is um, uh, a little bit problematic because it doesn't have quite the same uh, role as feedback in engineered systems, um, but there's feedback that is coming from the top of these structures and is in fact doing something which is error correction. So as you gain an input into your brain, take the Hockney painting that I was talking about, there is an activation of a very complex set of machines that are permeated with knowledge, both the one that comes from your genetics and the ones that were acquired in your lifetime and that you have reasoned over and, and cultivated and organized. And it is in the encounter of the input and the, uh, the output that is coming from those top systems that you find a, d a difference uh, in an error and you can make a correction of, of the prediction that you're generating. So in fact, you're operating all the time as prediction machines and your, your, your perception is not just what came in, is what came in in relation to what you're producing at any given moment, which is of course going to be different depending on the level of maturity that you have from being a kid to being an adult or to being an adult with a lot of experience that you have analyzed and meditated on. Um, by the way, the, the, the idea that uh, intuition favors the prepared mind is actually full of wisdom and it's exactly that. It captures the idea. You have to fill the mind, fill your brain with knowledge, you have to have worked on that knowledge and then you can come to something that you could call wisdom. Now, um, let's turn around and go to sensing and to uh, this application of this wonderful uh, new world of technology to medicine and to something that I think would be quite ideal, which would be to have personalized medicine, not just for the benefit of insurance companies to have the maximizing of their profits, but also for all of us to have uh, you know, healthier and saner lives. Um, and I uh, loved your presentation earlier on with, uh, about the sensors, but I had a couple of, of, of questions that I was, and comments that I was making as you were talking, and, and in fact, this is in part a question to you. Um, so you, you, you'll handle it the way you want. Um, a lot of what you were saying has as an assumption uh, that everyone is equally involvable and responsive uh, in the use of these sensors. But in fact, that can't possibly be the case. 
you know, we vary with age, gender, uh, our culture, uh, our personality, our life experience. So we have all of those different factors. Uh, and although it's quite exciting to imagine that you're going to respond and use this in some way that, of course, with huge volumes of data, you can sort of gloss over the differences. I wonder the degree to which those differences are going to play a role. The other thing is that I would like to know what is known about what I would call the wear and tear of wearing these devices. Uh, so during a period of novelty, you know, I've never worn any one of these things, but I can perfectly well imagine that for six months I would be a good boy and I would, you know, pay attention to things and try to use the data. Uh, once the novelty wears out, what will happen? Will I still pay, pay attention? I think that would be a very interesting uh, question. Uh, then the other uh, has to do with reliability of measurements. Uh, for example, uh, uh, any, uh, I take it that not many of you are physicians. Uh, something very, very simple, such as measuring blood pressure, uh, is notoriously uh, varied depending on how you do it. Whether you measure the blood pressure uh, with a person sitting or lying down or standing with uh, the, the, the measurement uh, at the level of the heart with an arm extended or with an arm up or with an arm down produces entirely different measurements. How are those measurements being made, especially when they're be being made by devices that are extremely simple and that I think have a built-in uh, level of error that is um, considerable. Uh, so th these are all uh, things that are important. The same as when you move to projecting all of these newly acquired data on, for example, our genetic information. Uh, 23andMe is a lovely thing to, to have and a variety of other such uh, um, measurements, but they are notoriously non-concordant. So you, they can produce different uh, results in relation to a lot of things that are very important to us, such as, for example, the possibility of having diabetes or the possibility of having a certain kind of cancer. So you want to know the reliability on how you're going to construct models with that built-in error. Again, I think that the, the, the beauty of big data is that it probably can gloss over some differences and, and pasteurize the thing in such a way that they may play less role. But I would like to see that discussed because I think it's a very important point. Uh, and then there was something that I think Carla mentioned, which is uh, important, uh, which is the, the, the comparison with the black box uh, of the airplane and the reference to the, to the uh, plane crash over the Amazon. Um, so the, the uh, in a way, I am, of course, very horrified by the pilot who refused to, to listen to what the machine was telling him. Um, on the other, I have a certain amount of sympathy. The sympathy is, of course, because it is opaque, uh, you want to rely, especially if you are an awake and breathing human being with a brain, uh, you want to prefer to rely on your own judgment. And on many circumstances, that turns out to be a good judgment. In fact, there are plenty of circumstances, for example, in war theaters, where the judgment of an individual was far superior to the judgment that could have come from central command uh, 10 kilometers away. Um, on the other hand, uh, what happens is that in the black box situation and navigation of airplanes, it turns out that you're not dealing with life systems. You're dealing with something that compared with our own bodies is pathetically, comically simple. Uh, and you can, in fact, put in practically all the parameters that would be of any consequence, and you have a very high likelihood that the response that you're gonna get from the machine is extremely accurate. When you think about human beings, when you think about the fact that every cell in your body, and I'm not talking just about the neurons in your brain, every cell in your body is an autonomous living organism that has its own uh, complement of genes, its own metabolism, its own control, and its own life cycle with birth, midlife, and death. With very few exceptions, all our cells 
are prone to that, except, in fact, for the majority of neurons, which stay with us for an entire life, which is the reason why we have a prayer of even understanding ourselves and recognizing us over a lifetime. Precisely because our neurons don't change, our neurons don't die, but everything else does. Everything, everything in your body does. So, the complexity is of such high order that uh, it, it, it really uh, makes one sympathize with decisions that are not just coming from the machine, but are being filtered by our judgment and where we have to play a bigger role. Again, I'm perfectly ready to surrender uh, that personal judgment, provided I know the algorithms have used something of my own humanity, of my own wetness into it. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm ready to give in. And final, final comment is that, you know, it's extremely easy to imagine that you would be able to convince most people to do the right thing just by giving them knowledge. Uh, and just by telling them, do what is right for you. And that, of course, that of course reminds me of Mrs. Reagan when she uh, was asked to uh, solve the problem of drug addiction in the United States. And she said, it's very simple, just say no. Uh, and of course, go tell that to the drug addicts that, or to the alcoholics that are hooked on their respective drugs. Just saying no is something that is not going to work. Why? Because we do have things called motivations and desires and appetites that are extremely powerful, ex especially when the drugs or whatever else you're addicted to, does not have to be a drug, can be sex, for example, uh, when those uh, operations have a way of hijacking the systems of pleasure uh, in your own body, in your own brain. And when that happens, then the problem gets very complicated. And in fact, a lot of the things that we need to do if we're going to make people be healthier is, for example, exercise frequently and regularly. It doesn't need to be something very complicated. Walking will do. Uh, and eating intelligently, uh, which means not drinking too much, not consuming too much of the things that in fact are adorably desirable to eat. And all of that requires something that it can be best called a passion that counters the other passion. Uh, and I will end by reminding you that one of my favorite philosophers, that's Spinoza, Spinoza said that the only way to counter a negative passion is by having a stronger passion that is positive. In other words, you don't combat a negative desire by having a reason. You combat the negative desire by having a stronger desire that in fact informs and gives energy to the reason. Otherwise it doesn't work. So, thank you very much. <laughs>